the Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Mysterious Traveler, written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan, and starring tonight two of radio's foremost actors, Lawson Zerby and Cameron Prudhomme, in an original radio drama titled Zero Hour. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, as you hear the story I call Zero Hour. Our story tonight begins in the large, luxurious office of Dr. William Jackson, the noted psychiatrist. Dr. Jackson, a tall, intelligent-looking man in his late 50s, is seated in a chair beside a fireplace reading a patient's case history. As he reads, the door to his office is quietly opened, and Keith Roberts, a slender, nervous man of 35, peers into the room. Pardon me, Doctor. Oh, it's you, Mr. Roberts. Come in. Thank you. Is there anything I can do for you? Doctor, I I just couldn't stay in my room. I, I must talk to you. I simply must. Well, now, won't tomorrow do? No, no. It'll be too late then. It's got to be tonight. I see. Well, here, take this chair by the fireplace. Thank you. Doctor, I, I know you're my final hope. That if you don't find me sane, they'll put me away. This is my last chance. I must make you see that my story is true. Are you sure it can't wait till tomorrow? No, no. Every minute counts. Even now, time is running out. You sound as though an overwhelming disaster were about to happen. Yes, yes, Doctor. That's just it. A disaster such as the world has never known is about to happen. It will affect every human being on Earth. Suppose you start from the beginning and tell me everything. From the beginning? Yes. Well, I... I suppose it all began that day six months ago in Philip Cromwell's office. Cromwell is the fellow who publishes my books. I'm a writer, you know. Uh, yes, I know. Well, Cromwell told me that he had acquired the literary rights to the life of the world-famous scientist, Professor Dana Friedberg. And I was the man who would write the professor's biography. I think that day, Doctor, was the happiest in my life. I was to have the opportunity to talk to Professor Dana Friedberg every day and grow to know him intimately. He was a scientist and humanitarian who I, like countless thousands, had admired and respected for years. Well, it was with a certain feeling of excitement that I arrived at Ardmore, Pennsylvania, where the professor lived and taught. I registered at the inn and then phoned the professor's secretary for an appointment. Professor Friedberg lived in a small cottage, and as his housekeeper led me to his study, I could see the house was plainly furnished. The study itself was overflowing with books. They were everywhere. And there amidst the books sat the professor himself. White-haired, small, puffing on a pipe. Come in, Mr. Roberts, come in. Thank you, professor. Here, let me remove the books from this chair so you can sit down. So, you are the young man who is going to write my biography. Yes, sir. I want this book to do justice to your life, professor. Professor. To make people realize what you've contributed to humanity. Well, I might have contributed a great deal more if people only understood men of science. How do you mean, sir? Uh, scientists work and think in terms of the future. Scientific research has always been handicapped by men who had no faith in the visions of science. Well, don't you think, Professor, science has achieved so many miracles that people aren't as skeptical as they once were? I wish I could agree. But believe me, Mr. Roberts, if I were to advance the theory that there is a civilization on Mars, <laughs> many people would say that old Professor Friedberg is in his dotage. Yes, I suppose you're right. Uh, you speak of a civilization on Mars. Do you... Do you have any theories on that, Professor? No, none at all, my friend. But it is quite possible there is a civilization on Mars, one even more highly developed than our own. Well, I find the idea quite intriguing. We scientists here on Earth are planning atomic-powered ships. Ships that will be able to fly to other planets. Who knows, perhaps Mars or some other planet 
is far in advance of us scientifically. <laughs> Perhaps we will wake up one morning to find that we have visitors from another planet. Strange, isn't it? When we think of such things, it's always we who will fly to another planet. It never occurs to us that another planet may reach us first. Exactly. <laughs> and yet, who knows? At this very moment, a rocket ship or some other type may be on its way to Earth. Yes, my friend, things may be happening on other planets that we here on Earth cannot even comprehend. <laughs> yes, I have learned one important fact in this long life of mine. Anything is possible. The days that followed went swiftly. And as the weeks slipped by and my notes on the professor accumulated, I knew that his was one of the great minds of all time. I was constantly astounded by his wide knowledge on a score of subjects. And it was small wonder that famous people from all over the world came to see this remarkable man. It was almost with regret that four months later, I finished the biography and called upon the professor to say goodbye. Oh, so you are returning to New York? Yes, Professor. I shall miss our daily talks, Keith. Yes, it had become a most pleasant habit. I'll miss them, too. Professor, is anything wrong? Wrong? What makes you ask? Oh, come now, Professor. We've known each other for over five months. By this time, I, I can sense your every mood, and something seems to be worrying you. Yes, Keith, something is. I don't know whether you read about it in the papers, but a week ago there was a tremendous explosion in the wilds of Montana. Yes, I, I recall the papers said it was a meteor. Yes, that seemed the obvious answer. After all, a meteor crashing into Earth is not an uncommon event. Are you trying to tell me it wasn't a meteor? A government investigation was made at the site of the explosion. A huge piece of metal weighing several tons was found buried deep in the earth. But that certainly sounds like a meteor. Yes, yes, it does. But when the metal was dug up and examined, a very curious fact was revealed. What was that? The metal could not be identified. It was a new element, never before seen on earth. A new element? Yes. Every conceivable test was made. It is a metal that is a... A thousand times harder than steel, and yet it is lighter. Well, what does Washington think? They believe it to be a meteor, a type that never crashed onto Earth before. And what do you believe, Professor? I have a theory, Keith, which I have not told to anyone as yet. Do you recall our conversation the day we met? Oh, well, yes. I mentioned at the time that it was quite conceivable that some other planet might have a much higher civilization than our own. Yes, and you said it was possible that we might wake up some morning and discover that we had visitors from... Professor, you don't mean that, that the explosion... Why not? We... You think that explosion might have been a rocket ship from another planet that crashed into the Earth? It is only a theory, but it is not beyond the realm of possibility. If that is true, then it, it means this metal is wreckage. Yes, before passing on this theory to Washington, I should like to conduct a personal investigation. Well, you mean go to Montana, the site of the explosion? Yes. Would you care to go with me? I'd like to very much. Good, good. Then I suggest we leave tomorrow without divulging our plans to anyone. We fly to Helena, Montana, hire a car there, and drive the rest of the way. How much further do you think it is, Professor? It uh, should be uh, just beyond that hill ahead. Well, this certainly is desolate country. You can hardly call this a road. Yes. That large ranch house we passed 20 miles back is the nearest dwelling to where the explosion occurred. Well, uh, we're coming to the top of the hill. Oh, there it is, Professor. Oh, say, that's quite a hole. Yes. According to the report, it is 200 feet in diameter, 70 feet deep. What an explosion that must have been. I understand it was visible for 60 miles. Well, just what are your plans, Professor? Well, the hole has already been thoroughly examined by the government investigators. 
I suggest that he carefully search the ground for hundreds of yards around the hole. They may have overlooked something. I see. Well, here we are, Professor. Yes. <laughs> now we shall see if there is any substance to my theory. <laughs> Professor? Uh, yes? Found anything yet? No, no. Oh, we've been searching for almost two days now. You think there's much point in looking any further? Uh, let us not give up yet, Keith. But we're already a mile from the site of the explosion. It isn't likely that anything landed this far away. I do not agree with you. An explosion that intense could... Hello? What is this? What's that you're digging up? <laughs> Seems like a piece of metal. It is so covered with dirt that it is hard to tell. Keith, it is a small metal cylinder. Yes, you're right. Yes. And it is made of the same metal. Look, look. There are small grooves on the end of the cylinder. And symbols. Symbols? Let me see. Yes. You're right. There are five of them. I... I've never seen symbols like these before. Nor I. And I am familiar with 12 languages. Professor, this means you're right. That explosion, it wasn't a meteor. It was the wreck of a rocket ship from another planet. Yes. Yes, I am convinced of it now. What's our next step, Professor? We must get to Washington at once. This is a matter of the highest importance. This find we have made... It means a new era has begun for mankind. Keith, perhaps you had better stop at that ranch house up ahead. Why, Professor? I will use their telephone and call Washington. I'll ask General Thompson of the War Department to put an army plane at our disposal. Well, that sounds like a good idea. There are probably several army planes at Helena. Yes, I am sure there are. The general can have us flown nonstop to Washington. Oh, but we are coming to the private road that turns into the ranch house. Yes, I see it. How do you do, gentlemen? My name is Jason DeCoven. I'm owner of this ranch. I understand you wish to use my telephone. Yes, if it is not too much trouble. I'm very sorry, Professor Friedberg, but my phone is out of order. I, I see you know me. <laughs> but of course, Professor. I've long been a great admirer of yours. I am sorry your phone is not working. Come, Keith, we had better be going. Oh, but, Professor, it's already dark. It's time for supper. Won't you join me? I'd be honored. Uh, no, thank you. We really must be on our way. Come, come now, Professor. Surely Washington can wait. A few more hours. What makes you think we're going to Washington? My men were watching the two of you from a distance as you examined the site of the explosion. Naturally, I assume you're on your way to Washington with the results of your investigation. Tell me, Professor, did you find anything of interest? Who are you? I've already told you, Professor. My name is Jason de Coven. Your accent, I cannot seem to place it. Would you mind telling me your nationality? <laughs> Come now, Professor. As one of Earth's most brilliant scientists, surely you must have guessed by this time. I see it all now. Yes, I see it all. Professor, what's this about? Who is this fellow? Keith, we have made a terrible blunder. What do you mean? That explosion was a rocket ship from another planet. But you and I mistakenly assumed it was the first. You mean other landings have been attempted? Yes. But how do you know? Standing before you is living proof that a successful flight has been made from another planet to this Earth. You mean de Coven? Yes. But he looks like you or I or, or anyone else. Quite true. But nevertheless, he is not a creature of the Earth. From what planet are you, de Coven? I am from Mars, Professor. Mars. Yes, gentlemen. I can see you're overwhelmed by all this, and understandably so. Might I suggest supper? And after we've had supper, I shall be glad to answer any questions you may wish to ask. The 
pity you gentlemen weren't in the proper frame of mind to enjoy this supper. My chef exiled himself tonight. I see you're both impatiently waiting to ask questions. Please feel free to do so, gentlemen. How long have you been on Earth, Mr. Bicot? I arrived in 1931. 1931? Yes, 17 years ago. I arrived on the first atomic rocket ship. Just uh, how many flights have been made these past 17 years between Mars and Earth? 411. That explosion 10 days ago of one of our ships was our first mishap. Most unfortunate. Those 411 flights you speak of, were all the landings made here? Uh, yes, this is our main base. Our ships land here at night, dispose of passengers, and take off in a matter of three hours. Passengers? Just how many men from Mars are there on Earth at this moment? A little over 40,000. 40,000? Yes. 7,000 are in the United States. The others are scattered all over the world. For what purpose? I believe in this country you call it a fifth country. In other words, you are preparing for an invasion? Yes, Professor. But why? Why? We Martians, Professor, are but 200 years ahead of the Earth, scientifically speaking. Council of Mars believes that if we don't conquer Earth now, someday Earth will conquer us. It is what you might term a preventive war. You're actually going to invade us? Yes, Mr. Hubbard. We now have 40,000 agents in key positions all over the world. And our fleet of invasion ships are ready. I take it then that we may expect the invasion momentarily. Yes, to be exact, the Earth will be invaded on June 22nd at 8.30 p.m., New York time. But well, that's less than a month from now. Yes. And your plans are to wipe out the people on Earth? Only if there is this. That would be most foolhardy. A fleet of 200 atomic ships carry weapons that will overwhelm you in a matter of minutes. For our Martians, one is the equal of ten Earth men. You don't seem to think very highly of us. Uh, you misunderstand me. You see, we have advanced many ways scientifically. Not only do we live longer, but we Martians are ten times as strong as you Earth men. You don't look it. <laughs> I shall prove it. Do you see that log by the fireplace? Oh, yes. Notice that the diameter of this log is almost two feet. Could any Earthman break this log in half with his bare hands? Certainly not. What? I said, did you see that? He shattered the log and split it. A very trivial feat. All the Martians are just as strong as I, some even stronger. You are very quiet, Professor. I was thinking of the evening of June 22nd and the invasion. Yes. Let us hope that no resistance will be offered. Well, gentlemen, now that you are my guest, I will show you to your room. This way, please. Professor, what are we going to do? Speak softly, Keith. Your room may have a dictaphone. Yes, yes, you're right. Somehow we must warn Washington of the forthcoming invasion. There is little that can be done to stop the Martians, but we must prepare. Escape from here is impossible. Look out the window, Professor. That wire fence is charged with electricity. The grounds are all lit up with those floodlights, and there are guards everywhere. Yes, this ranch is like a fortress. And yet we must escape Warren Washington. I'm afraid it's hopeless, Professor. Perhaps not. Oh? What do you mean? Keith, this ranch has its own power plant to generate electricity. Now, if I were to short-circuit the system, you might be able to escape in the darkness and confusion. Yes, maybe I could. Look. It is a 12-foot jump from the window to the ground. And then to the garage, it is 20 yards. Now, if you are fortunate, you will be able to start the car before anyone can stop you. But, Professor, there's the gate. How will I get out? It is 200 yards from the garage to the fence. If you get up enough speed, you ought to be able to crash through the gate. Yes, you're right. But what about you, Professor? I don't want to leave you here. Well, it cannot be helped, Keith. I am a little too old for running. You will have to make it alone. All right, Professor. But the moment I reach the village, I'll notify the sheriff. No, no, Keith, you must not do that. You heard what De Coven said. He has Martian agents scattered all over the country. The sheriff may be one of them. Yes. 
Yes, I hadn't thought of that. Once you escape, the Cohen will leave no stone unturned to recapture you. You must get to Washington before he can stop you. Who am I to see in Washington? General Wadsworth, head of scientific research. Tell him exactly what happened and the date for the invasion. All right, Professor. Stand by the window while I create a short circuit. There is a socket in the wall over here. Ah, yes, yes. This will do. Now, the minute the lights go out, jump, Keith, and keep running. Yes, Professor. Good luck. Thank you, sir. There go the lights. Jump, Keith. I jumped out of the window before the words were out of the professor's mouth. The moment I hit the ground, I started running. In a matter of seconds, I reached the garage and climbed into my car. Fortunately, there were no guards nearby. I started the motor, stepped on the gas, and the car roared out of the garage. The car was doing 60 miles an hour as it crashed through the front gate and onto the main highway. Shots rang out as I crouched low in the driver's seat. A half hour later, I reached a small town and succeeded in hiring a pilot and a private plane. As we took off, a car came racing across the airfield, trying unsuccessfully to prevent the takeoff. Fifteen hours later, I was in Washington, telling my story to General Wadsworth. And uh, you say, Mr. Roberts, you escaped from the ranch in Montana last night. Yes, General, and Professor Friedberg is still there, a prisoner of this Martian agent, Dekovic. We must rescue him, General, we must. Now, please don't excite yourself, Mr. Roberts. I've sent for a doctor, and he'll be here any minute. He'll give you something to calm your nerves. A doctor? You mean you don't believe me? You think I imagined everything? You've probably been working too hard, and as a result... But I tell you, it's the truth, every word of it. The professor is a prisoner of this Martian agent, DeCoven. Why won't you believe me? Here's today's newspaper. If you look at this story on the front page, you'll note that Professor Friedberg is dead. Dead? Yes. He was found dead in his bed at Ardmore, Pennsylvania, this morning. Furthermore, a medical examination revealed he's been dead 48 hours. Heart attack. <laughs> That's impossible. The professor was with me last night in Montana. Just 16 hours ago. Please, Mr. Roberts, get hold of yourself. It's all here in the paper, just as I've told you. Well, well wait a minute. Now I'm beginning to see what happened. Please, Mr. Roberts. De Coven murdered the professor with a drug. A drug that made it appear as if he'd died of a heart attack. Yes, that must be it. But you said you'd seen the professor only 16 hours ago. Yet the medical examiner said he'd been dead 48 hours. De Coven's behind that. Somehow De Coven has made it appear that the professor has been dead 48 hours to discredit my story. And after he murdered the professor, he had the body thrown to the professor's home. Don't you see, General? De Coven wants you to think I'm insane to prevent you from believing my story. Now, you must listen to me. The Martian invasion is scheduled for June oh. 1st. There you are at last, Doctor. I am afraid Mr. Roberts here is very badly in need of your services. See what you can do, won't you, Doctor? That was several weeks ago, Doctor. And ever since that day I told General Wadsworth my story, I've been confined to this institution. One doctor after another has examined me, but they're all a pack of fools. None of them believe me. Dr. Williams, you're my last hope. I know that. If you don't help me, then there's no one else I can turn to. I'll do anything I can for you, Mr. Roberts. Then don't let them put me away. I know my story sounds fantastic, but it's true. You must believe me. I do believe you, Mr. Roberts. You do? Yes. There are one or two things in your story I'd like to check. Of course, Doctor. Of course, I I knew you'd see I was, I was telling the truth. To begin with, you say this Martian, DeCoven, was it? Yes, Jason DeCoven. Yes, you say this fellow DeCoven picked up a log that was two feet in diameter and crushed it in his hand. Yes, Doctor. He splintered that thick log into a hundred pieces. Oh, that's incredible. Would you say the log was as thick as this one by my fireplace? Yes, just about the same size. So, Doctor, why are you picking the log up? I just... I want to show you something. You... You splintered the log into small pieces. Just as de Coven did. You! You are one of them. A Martian. Yes, Mr. Roberts. De Coven said they were scattered all over the world. In key positions. Quite true. We've been watching you with great amusement these past weeks. 
We knew your story would never be believed, not after de Coven's clever disposal of Professor Friedberg. Or what are you going to do with me? Declare me insane and confine me to this institution? Oh, no, Mr. Roberts. You're perfectly free to leave at any time. I'm free to go? Yes, any time you desire. Aren't you afraid that, that someone in Washington might believe me? No, Mr. Roberts. You no longer present a problem. I believe you said the invasion was scheduled to occur on June 22nd at 8.30 p.m. New York time. Is that correct? Yes. In other words, tonight. Tonight? Yes. Didn't you know it's June 22nd? I've lost most the time. I see by my watch it's exactly 8.28. According to your story, the invasion should start in just two minutes. Yes. I'll open a window so we can see the skies. Yes. There's the Martian invasion fleet coming into the stratosphere. Mr. Roberts, I do believe your story. It is now zero hour. The invasion has begun. Mysterious traveler. Did you enjoy our trip? What's that? You don't like the idea of the Martians conquering the Earth? Well, I wouldn't worry too much about Keith Roberts' story. After all, tonight is June 22nd, and it is 8.30. But I don't see any Martians around. Do you? I'm afraid poor Mr. Roberts. Imagine the story he told Dr. Williams. And when Dr. Williams told him it was a delusion, Robert felt he was being persecuted and accused Dr. Williams of being a Martian agent. Now, I recall another young man who insisted that he... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at the same time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. All characters in tonight's story were fictitious and any resemblance to the names of actual persons was purely coincidental. In tonight's cast were Maurice Tarplin, Lawson Zerbe, Cameron Prudhomme, and Bill Smith. Original music was played by Paul Taubman. Sound was by George Cooney, broadcast engineer Al King. Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. <laughs> Listen next week to a tale titled, You Only Die Once. Another strange and suspenseful tale of the mysterious traveler. This program has come to you from our New York studios. Another program of tense and dramatic action will follow in just a minute. Stay tuned to the station for Official Detective. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.